Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to the Commonwealth Club located in San Francisco. It's my pleasure uh, today to be your moderator for today's event featuring Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a name well known to anyone who enjoys reading about uh, our universe and thinking about questions about from whence it came and, and where is it going. Uh, Dr. Tyson's education actually relates to a, a physics degree from Harvard and a PhD in astrophysics from Columbia. His professional research in cosmology and astrophysics, including very broad subjects including star formation, exploding stars, dwarf galaxies, and the structure of the Milky Way. In 2001, Dr. Tyson was appointed to a 12-member commission that studied the future of the U.S. aerospace industry which have published a final report in 2002. Again in 2004, Dr. Tyson was again appointed to serve on a nine-member commission on the implementation of the United States Space Exploration Policy. Following upon that, Dr. Tyson was appointed by NASA uh, to help them deal with the very difficult question of how the ambitious uh, programs of NASA can be reconciled with a very restricted budget for their goal and mission. Uh, we are, of course, blessed not only with his technical expertise as it informs the scientific community, but he is a very important member of that community of scientists who help inform the public to a greater understanding of scientific issues, a topic which is more and more important as we as a public are decided to have opinions about and vote for people to represent us who might have a, at least a lay understanding and hopefully even an enlightened understanding of the critical scientific issues facing us today. In this regard, Dr. Tyson has published seven books that are directed towards people like us and is the host, of course, of the NOVA Science Now program with which you may be very familiar with him. I would like to, at this moment, introduce Dr. Tyson and please give him a rousing welcome. Thank you for that warm welcome. It's good to be uh, back in this visit to San Francisco. I'm told the sun was out a couple of days ago. Is that right? It's, the rain is, uh, plants need rain more than we do. Uh, Thanks for coming out for this. I'm here to just kind of talk about the universe, but through the lens, <laughs> I'm restricted to the universe in my subject matter. Um, uh, in Death by Black Hole, uh, first, I couldn't resist that title. Uh, there's a chapter in here with that title, and that chapter bears that title because it's a complete discussion of how you die when you fall into a black hole. And when I think of black holes, I think of sort of the adult counterpart to what, as a kid, would be T-Rex, because every, every kid loves T-Rex. But why do they love T-Rex? It's because T-Rex can eat the kid, all right? And you tend to have a deep respect for things that can eat you. So black holes, when you come too close to them, weird things happen to your body. And I'll get back to that in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm not gonna read from the book, because you can just get the book and read the book yourself. So presumably you came to hear me say something differently enlightening or even relatedly enlightening to what's in the book. And so what I'm gonna do is, I look, the book is organized into sections with multiple chapters within. I'm gonna like pick one of the chapters within its section that happened to be one of my favorites and then I'll just kind of give you some summary points of those chapters. Okay, and then, so this will be a sampling of the science that titillates me. But also, this collection is the science that has been most requested by the public. Even if I didn't think it was interesting, the public thought it was interesting. I said, well, let me find out why. And part of it was this black hole thing. Everybody wants to know about black holes. If I'm on the plane and someone sees I'm reading some astrophysics literature, I say, what, what do you do? I do astrophysics. First question is, tell me about black holes. <laughs> then maybe search for life in Big Bang. And, and I'm trying to think, well, suppose I said I was like, you know, 
nuclear chemist or particle physicist, that would just end the conversation right there. But they find that like, I study the universe and it becomes this very engaged conversation. So there's this appetite for cosmic content that, for which I see myself as a servant of public interest. And so the, the material that's in here is the blending of aspects of the universe that I want to bring you to and aspects of the universe for which I know the public has a deep curiosity uh, uh, to learn more about. And so that's how that goes. Uh, and let me lead off by the, with the following uh, datum. There's, there's about 6,500 astrophysicists in the world. It's not very many, actually. It's just, you know, a few thousand. And there's about six and a half billion people in the world. So if you divide those two numbers, you get one in a million. <laughs> so, no, no, what I mean, now the point of that exercise, the point of that exercise is, if you ever find yourself in the company of an astrophysicist, that's your chance to ask the question. Because you never know when that's gonna happen again. That's, that's just advice, okay? And I think that's why like I said, I'm on the airplane, the people just bust out with questions. Like they've got some question center within them and it's building up and they're ready to explode and the whole rest of it, so, uh, that's just so you know. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Uh, what I try to do here is connect the reader to the universe in a way that allows you to become a participant in the, in the machinery of the cosmos. So I like to think of this book as your way to go around the back door and lift the hatch and see the gears turning and the, the oil box and the, and the pulleys and the levers and all the things that allow you to understand not simply what's in the universe, but how the universe works. And in that way, you're empowered to have fresh thoughts about what's going on rather than just repeat the factual information you'd otherwise get. And that's the goal of this book, okay? And I invite you to share in that goal if in fact uh, you value that level of uh, intellectual diversions in what is otherwise your work day. So I've got a, a chapter called Coming to Our Senses. And I'm told I have like half an hour or something, right? Is that about, about a half hour? I'm happy to do that. All I want, okay. I'll give you a late pass when you go back to work, okay, if you need. Uh, coming to our senses. There's a whole chapter called Coming to Your Senses. And what that is, you know we've got five senses, right? Uh, touch, taste, smell, touch, taste, sight, hearing, thank you, thank you. Touch, five senses. And then occasionally you get the person who comes up to you and says, I have a sixth sense, okay? These are people who claim to know stuff that they wouldn't otherwise know, typically. Uh, it turns out if you take those people and put them in the laboratory, the sixth sense just simply goes away under controlled circumstances. So either the sixth sense is this shy thing that doesn't lend itself to, to investigation, or it just doesn't exist at all and we've duped ourselves into believing you had this power. But what I want to share with you is the fact that modern science, beginning beginning 20th century, began to invent apparatus that would measure things that are completely outside of your five senses. No capacity to measure it whatsoever. So that in fact, modern science has multiple senses, dozens of senses. So you wanna ask, what's, you have a sixth sense? Here's some things you can't measure. For example, the magnetic field in this room. The human body has no capacity to measure the strength of a magnetic field. The human body has no strength to measure whether we are being bombarded by ionizing radiation. You'd eventually figure that out as your limbs fell off, you know, as you, you'd come to learn that this was the case, but while it was happening, you would have no idea. We don't have radiation, high energy radiation detectors built into our system. We've got detectors that can do it. So if there's something emitting ionizing radiation 